Uh, thank you everybody for uh, having me, hosting me in this uh, um, seminar series and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and today I'm going to present uh, on uh, uh, living with uh, leopards uh, coexisting with pastoralist communities in northern Kenya. But before that, just let me uh, introduce uh, a little bit myself and uh, I'm, as I'm a human geographer, uh, you will see some uh, uh, maps uh, uh, during this uh, presentation, starting with this one, for example. Hmm. Echo. Uh, uh, as you might uh, hear, my English uh, has an accent. Uh, indeed, uh, the green uh, countries, uh, Italy and Argentina, are my home countries. My family is from Argentina, but I grew up in Italy. So that's why my English has a, an Italian accent. And uh, as just mentioned uh, uh, by Dr. Paolo Alves, um, right now I'm a senior researcher in Cordoba, uh, which uh, you can see in, in purple. But before that I did, uh, I was an associate director uh, within the community engagement team uh, for the San Diego Zoo uh, Wildlife Alliance uh, in California. And what you see the other places uh, is where I actually did my PhD and where I studied uh, uh, and where I was working as a professor researcher in Mexico in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, so while I was uh, an associate director uh, in the San Diego Zoo uh, Wildlife Alliance, I was uh, um, overseeing several community based uh, programs. As you can see, a lot of places uh, were wild and a lot of uh, different uh, species of animals. Uh, all the projects were uh, socio ecological, and uh, myself, I was overseeing the social component of these programs. Uh, most of them, all of them actually, are about uh, human, different types of human wildlife interaction. Uh, some of the ones that I'm going to present today is about uh, human wildlife conflict, but uh, others uh, uh, I've been, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, overseeing programs for the illegal wildlife trade. Um, so, Speaking of the human wildlife uh, conflict and human wildlife interaction, uh, we can see that there has been a huge increase uh, in uh, a publication, a scientific publication over the time uh, about human wildlife conflict. And in this, this term, conflict uh, is definitely more defined uh, and just now uh, last year, this year we published uh, with the IUCN Human Wildlife Conflict Task Force that I'm part of uh, the definition of the IUCN, which uh, describes the human wildlife conflict as a struggle that emerged when the presence or the behavior of wildlife possess actual or perceived direct and recurring threat to human interest or needs leading to disagreement between groups of people and negative impact on people and their wildlife. To make it a bit more simple and more visual, we can see this uh, uh, in a more graphic way, where we can see that uh, uh, the human wildlife conflict uh, is made by few components. There is a real or perceived impact of the wildlife to the humans, so to the uh, uh, damage and component uh, more of the resources, then there is uh, the uh, human reaction toward uh, the wildlife, which is generally retaliatory killing, uh, uh, culling, uh, uh, and management. And then these components generally has a clash of opinions between different groups of how wildlife and the conservation of wildlife and the management of wildlife should be uh, organized. 
And uh, as we can see that uh, already, especially the third component uh, is where there is the human aspect of it. So uh, this is not really new that uh, already Aldo Leopold uh, realized that uh, the real problem is not how we shall handle the deer or the wildlife. The real problem is one of human management. Wildlife management is comparatively easy. Human management is difficult. And why so? Why do we actually need uh, uh, to focus on the human management, on the human component? Generally, because conservation management is fundamentally about humans and their behavior. It's us that decide whether to hunt or whether we want to observe the wildlife as a two kind of examples here. And also because uh, uh, humans have different uh, uh, worldviews on how we believe uh, uh, we should manage the habitat, the wildlife. So we have different components and these two, as we can see in this uh, comic, might clash. Somebody can see that we need to cut down the forest and others have to conserve. So there is a clash of opinions and that's where create uh, the conflict. The conflict is more about uh, humans uh, over wildlife rather than human wildlife conflict. Uh, if we compare, uh, and how we study this component uh, is uh, through the, what is called human dimension of wildlife, which is basically uh, obtaining uh, information using concept and methods of social science about people. So understanding their attitudes, values, norms, uh, uh, and the society and the culture and using this information to make decisions about conservation itself. And a comparison of, uh, uh, we saw how human wildlife conflict uh, um, uh, literature uh, is uh, way increasing. We can see slowly also picking a little bit uh, what is a human wildlife coexistence. Uh, as a term. However, as a term, and this is just a publication that we did uh, this year and it's only about uh, uh, Africa. However, you already can see that there is a big difference in uh, uh, what is uh, mentioned in a paper and instead um, uh, when it's actually defined within the paper. So, we still have to learn more about uh, this concept of human wildlife coexistence. We are not uh, uh, sure how to define it and how to measure. There is uh, quite a discrepancy. And indeed my uh, main research right now in Cordoba is actually digging in, in understanding the term of coexistence and as well the two related terms of tolerance and acceptance. And I'm planning to use uh, some methods such as work cafe, Q, uh, Q methods uh, uh, to define and measure this concept. And if any of you is interested uh, specifically on these uh, projects, uh, you can reach out and we can discuss further about this component. Uh, but right now, I'm going to start discussing and give you an example of uh, the project uh, of living with leopard and coexisting with pastoralist communities in northern Kenya. So this is a project, uh, as I mentioned, that I was overseeing when I was uh, an associate director in the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance and has been called uh, by uh, local communities uh, and other organizations in Kenya and the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. Um, so looking at the steady area, uh, as mentioned, we are in the northern of Kenya and specifically uh, what I'm going to present today, it's a study 
that, uh, that has been done in the communities surrounding the Saba conservancies, which is here. And these are all the uh, communities around the Loisaba Conservancy is a 57 acre a private conservancy managed by the a Nature Conservation, TNC. Um, and within this uh, area of Northern Kenya, uh, just to, uh, if people never seen it, this is what it looks like a little bit, where there is a, a still a, a pastoralism. So it's basically herders, human settlements moving uh, across uh, uh, the habitat uh, with their uh, shoats. So it's uh, sheep and goats mainly, but they also have uh, camels and cattle. Uh, um, and they move these settlements depending on the season and uh, also depending on the uh, environment uh, circumstances. And it's important to conceive uh, this term of pastoralism, not only as a livelihood, so as an aspect of uh, economic uh, uh, component, but also as a cultural practice, is their community, is their identity. Uh, so when uh, we go ahead and understanding their perception, their attitudes, this aspect is uh, important to consider. Uh, so the African leopard, uh, uh, it is still currently um, identified as a vulnerable species by the IUCN category uh, because has been, uh, his uh, habitat range has been declining of uh, more than 30% in the last 20 years. And one of the major causes together with uh, habitat fragmentation and loss is retaliatory killing. Uh, it has been killed uh, because of the um, uh, attacks to, lively, uh, to livestock. Uh, having said that, that the range, the habitat range has declined, we are unsure yet on the population of uh, African leopards. And indeed, one of the aspects, as mentioned before, uh, is, that is a socio-ecological aspect uh, um, research, we are also studying uh, the um, assessment of the African leopard population. And we do that, uh, as you can see here in the map, by uh, locating uh, uh, remote uh, camera traps. Uh, and here we can see our uh, colleagues, both from uh, Kenya and uh, Nick Pilfall from uh, uh, San Diego Zoo, uh, locating uh, um, in a grid of uh, camera traps, but as well, uh, we have uh, put some hair snacks to individually identify with the genetic uh, uh, hair, uh, well, collecting genetics from the hair. And to do that, we use uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some different uh, baits to see which one uh, was more uh, efficient. Uh, none of them has been uh, animals, though. It's more uh, different perfumes. So the long-term objective of the study is to uh, understand the trend uh, of the attacks and how we can better uh, protect the livestock for these uh, uh, communities. Uh, doing that to try to reduce the conflict over leopards. So reducing the, especially the illegal killing of these uh, uh, species. And uh, at the same time, we want to try to improve, increase the benefits of coexistence with uh, these leopards. The conceptual framework that I used for this uh, study, as well as in general for the other study, is within the uh, human dimension uh, of wildlife uh, is called the cognitive hierarchy uh, and it's part of the uh, social psychology. And we can imagine it uh, using it uh, like a, as an iceberg where the behavior is the Latin, is an observable component. It's what we can see 
as what we humans uh, behave. And uh, these are generally numerous and fast to change because they are more specific to each situation. Underneath it, uh, we have the behavioral intention. So it's what uh, we say we are going to do, what we plan we will behave. Uh, um, and this uh, is influenced by our attitudes and norms. Attitudes are uh, an evaluation of an object or a topic, and it's generally divided itself by two components. Uh, the affective component, which is more the emotion, the feelings toward the wildlife, for example, and the norms instead can be the individual norms or the social norms is how we ought to behave or how we should uh, act based on our culture, uh, our family and our individual beliefs. Underneath that, what uh, is influenced, what influence our attitudes uh, and behavior intention and behaviors are the values and the value orientation. Values are a more abstract concept and therefore the value orientation is when uh, our values are more attached toward an object. And these are the basic, it's a pattern of different basic beliefs. And these are fewer in numbers and are slow to change, are generally created when we are young in our family and uh, the values themselves are more transcendent to the situation itself, so are more spread. Since I cannot go really too much into it, uh, I'm going to show an example. An mm -hmm. uh, uh, so if we look at the values, an example could be the respect for lives. Based on that, we, it's the influence of the value orientation, such as, for example, all animals have the same rights than human. Uh, this will influence our atti attitudes, the cognitive component of attitudes, such as we believe that leopards are endangered, and the affective attitudes, such as leopards are important for the ecosystem, as well as the norms. The leopard should be protected. Uh, all these influence uh, our behavioral intention, which uh, is uh, our plan to support, for example, the prohibi prohibition of killing leopards, and uh, which will potentially end up showing our behavior that we do not kill leopards. So based on this uh, uh, con uh, framework, we designed a questionnaire uh, for interviewing uh, all these communities around Rosaba. Uh, and the themes of the question were about the attitudes toward leopards, as mentioned, the norms and behavior, the risk perception, but as well then we asked uh, uh, the number of attacks and their intention of uh, killing uh, or protecting leopards. All these interviews were done in Ma, which is the local language. Uh, and we did uh, uh, an initial uh, 141 interviews uh, across uh, these communities. So uh, I'm going to show you now some results uh, from 2016, and then we repeat it uh, uh, later on. So I'll show you a bit more the uh, trend as well. Uh, as we can see from this map, uh, uh, it's a heated map where we see the green are more the positive attitudes toward leopards and uh, becoming more red is when the attitudes toward leopards are becoming more negative. And similarly, uh, when we ask whether they were perceiving having a problem with leopards, we can see that there are some areas uh, where um, the communities felt that they have uh, bigger problems with leopards 
than others that are in green. When we ask uh, the perception of leopard uh, uh, population, so how the number of leopards uh, was uh, uh, versus a uh, perception of conflict, we can see that uh, in both uh, uh, they believed uh, that the leopard population was increasing as the same as the conflict with leopards in the last three years. Uh, and then we ask as well, what was the perception? We, we paired the perception of conflict versus the livestock loss. And similarly to the previous slide, we can see that also in this case, they go hand in hand, an increase of conflict, an increase of livestock loss in the last, in a trend of the last three years in these communities. Uh, when we ask them which uh, was the um, most uh, uh, the carnivore uh, that they perceive uh, that uh, they had more problems with, we can see that the first one, the first choice was leopard and then hyena and third lion and few of them said wild dog or cheetah. So we can see that leopards, uh, you know, it's, there is something, there is a conflict, there is a problem with them. But at the same time, when we asked uh, in, a, in the norm what uh, they perceived uh, their community thing that killing uh, a leopard was acceptable, uh, most of them, 56% of them disagree. So, they don't think uh, uh, it is acceptable that to kill leopards. Still, they still do it, but they don't like to do it. So just a summary, a little bit, uh, as mentioned, like there is a high recognition that leopards are important. And uh, uh, while uh, nearly half of them once uh, would like uh, a decrease on uh, a population of leopards, uh, 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 29 percent also they don't uh, uh, they don't know or they didn't express their opinion towards this and uh, the reason why leopards attacked uh, their livestock is just they perceived that uh, there is a lack of prey inside the conservancy so they actually go outside so they perceives that the livestock, it's easier to prey than actually the wildlife that it's inside the conservancy. And that, as mentioned before, shoats or goats and sheep are the most vulnerable livestock. So after doing all these interviews, we did some meetings with the communities, first of all, to share our thoughts. Um, and I, as you can see, this is a way we do meetings uh, in Northern Kenya. Uh, they don't have, uh, it's just under a big acacia tree, uh, which provide a, a nice shade. Uh, but also we didn't want it only to share the result. We wanted to try to start uh, uh, closer collaboration and engagement of these communities to be part of the program, to increase the trust and the knowledge of uh, and leaving the uh, capacity uh, and the knowledge in these communities. Uh, and this is uh, one of the most important aspect of uh, a community-based programs where it's not uh, the researchers that goes in and leave, but uh, actually uh, build up the capacity and the knowledge stays within the communities. Uh, based on our uh, meetings with them, we decided uh, that we still didn't know, like everybody said uh, that they had a problem with the leopards, but there was actually no data uh, uh, of knowing how many actually livestock were killed and uh, how many leopards were around. So uh, 
together with the leaders of the different communities and the communities themselves, uh, we identified and uh, um, uh, 19 representatives distributed in these seven communities around Lusaba uh, to start monitoring the leopard attack at real time. So, uh, and especially this will help to evaluate the strategies later on to reduce the livestock. So we need some baseline data uh, to then see whether the, uh, how we were going to protect the livestock was going to be decreasing. Uh, so during uh, March 2018, uh, we trained, we built the capacity of this uh, 19 representative uh, using ArcGIS survey. Uh, I don't know if uh, many of you it's, uh, are familiar with this, um, but the ArcGIS survey is basically, you can use a, in a smartphone, also off-site, so you don't need internet, and uh, it's basically an Excel file where you can uh, insert uh, uh, different um, input uh, of uh, variables uh, of a questionnaire that we designed, and we were looking at uh, uh, where the uh, at livestock attack uh, happened inside or outside their boma, or basically where they live, uh, whether it was night or uh, um, day, but as well which actually was a carnivore they believed was. Uh, uh, the attacker and then take pictures. So um, this uh, then creates uh, all the information in the um, smartphone. And when they arrived uh, in an internet location, it can be uploaded and we can start looking at more trends uh, from it. And now I'm going to show you some of the uh, results coming from this uh, uh, conflict uh, network report. Uh, during a uh, year, March 2018, April 2019, they reported 825 attacks in total. And uh, uh, they perceived that, as we can see, the majority of uh, these attacks were done by leopards and hyena uh, in most of the cases. And something that is important to notice is that 45% uh, uh, of these attacks were done inside their boma, but also 55 were done outside their bomas. I'm going later on to show you some picture of the boma to conceptualize actually what is a boma. Um, but for the moment, I'm uh, first presenting some other results from this uh, uh, network. So um, the, from the reports, uh, we see that uh, uh, the majority indeed, uh, as they perceived, uh, were goats and then sheep, and really few cattle, uh, uh, camels and chicken. What we can say is that uh, uh, camels are way bigger and also way more expensive. So they definitely look after these animals uh, uh, and also there are fewer of them. And it's why chickens, they don't have many chickens. Uh, what we can see uh, within this year of data collection, that uh, there is some trends of when there are attacks. Uh, we can see some, a peak in June, November, January. And this is happening when there is a, a, is a raining season. Uh, and this is because uh, when there is a rain season, the wildlife disperse more, and so it is harder to attack, them, whereas the livestock always stay there, so they swift to attack more. Uh, this at least is what we perceive, that is, uh, they tend to attack more, more livestock during the rain season. We, um, during the, the interviews, we also asked uh, uh, what were the current measures they were using and the effectiveness of this uh, measurement. 
we can see that the majority of them use uh, some wire mesh, so like the chicken mesh, uh, and they perceive that it was effective. Some use some torches. Acacia is the tree, as mentioned before. Few use dogs. Uh, based on these results, uh, we decided together with the communities, we went back to the communities and discussed with them uh, which were the potential uh, um, pilot study deterrents that we wanted to use to protect their livestock. And uh, the, some of them preferred the wires, but uh, uh, some of them also were open to try this uh, deterrent lights that I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, that are actually lighter and cheaper. Uh, so we decided to do half and half of them in a total of 80 BOMAS, and they were installed in mid-2018. So after one year of uh, baseline data collection, we then decided to do this pilot study. And uh, we started, again, it's a community-based program. So we worked with the communities and uh, we um, shared the payment of both the wires and the deterrent lights. Uh, and they signed a contract with us that they took fully responsibility in maintaining uh, uh, them um, and we were not going to replace the, uh, any broken one unless they can demonstrate that it was a failure from the uh, fabric and this indeed happened in few cases for the deterrent lights. In this way this is a process for empowering uh, the communities and together with them we are continuing the conflict uh, uh, network report, uh, so monitoring uh, the trend of the life, livestock attacks, uh, as well as uh, uh, doing more uh, interviews uh, to monitor their change, in, if there is any change in attitudes, norms, and their behavior. Uh, so the, the BOMAS, a project the, or the deterrence project to, to protect. Uh, um, we wanted to ensure that uh, uh, we wanted to look at uh, the BOMA structure, uh, how the shape of the BOMA itself, how big it is, uh, the vegetation pattern around the BOMAs, uh, as well we are measuring the atmospheric condition, as mentioned before, uh, whether the uh, rain uh, and other has effect on the attacks, uh, the environmental condition in general about the climate and the human behavior. So uh, this is uh, uh, the distribution and the monitoring of uh, the BOMAS themselves. And uh, we have, uh, these are, the dots are the life, uh, the different communities, for example, in one part. Um, and this is how it is uh, the structure of the BOMA. These are, for example, trees. This is where we have like uh, located the uh, camera traps to see and measure and identify a potential uh, a carnivores uh, getting closer to the BOMA itself. Um, so this is uh, the uh, meteorological station uh, where we measure uh, the rain, uh, the wind, and uh, the temperature. And this is the camera traps uh, uh, of the outside border of the BOMA. This is uh, uh, how it is located, uh, the BOMA set for the light deterrents. So this is the uh, um, perimeter of the flight detection. And as you can see, this is where we have uh, located uh, the uh, lights that I'm going to show you in a moment. And as well, there are the camera traps. So 
if there is uh, a carnivore approaching, we can, uh, uh, there will be the light uh, uh, switching on, and as well, there is a camera uh, uh, that it will uh, record it in a video. And this is a little video of uh, the deterrent lights, how they work. So I start uh, flashing when it becomes night and it's a, uh, um, they are powered by solar panel. In this way, they don't need to recharge the batteries, but is directly uh, charged by uh, every day by the sun. Uh, also uh, to ensure that, uh, to reduce, uh, uh, as we saw that initially there were some um, issues uh, of uh, a community members uh, actually stealing uh, these lights uh, to put it within their little uh, house uh, to have some light in the house. We decided to donate uh, some, um, it's called the Lucy lamp, so also the, like solar lamps that they can actually put it inside their houses. Uh, this is a wire boma. So it's uh, an improved uh, wire that goes uh, uh, in, around their own uh, uh, Akasha uh, boma itself uh, with a door. And I'll show you now some more uh, pictures on the installation of the improved uh, uh, wire walls. And this is how uh, a boma looks like. So this is where uh, they will, uh, the communities, the local uh, communities will put their uh, goats and sheep uh, in the night to be protected. Uh, but as you can see, this is mainly done by some acacia or some uh, wire chicken. And what we did instead of installing a higher uh, wire boma and a stronger, and also uh, to ensure, because the leopards attack by jumping above, whereas the hyena actually create uh, a, a hole. So what we did is uh, this wire boma, we put it uh, underneath, uh, a little bit underneath uh, the land, to ensure that it actually protects uh, from uh, hyenas as well. And here as well, again, there is uh, uh, more uh, pictures on how it has been installed. And we can see the ladder that they use uh, to install uh, the bombas. Um, and this is a bit uh, the high after. This is Ambrose, who is the uh, local coordinator of the project. Uh, and uh, here you can see uh, on the right, this one, how it used to be the BOMA. And this is uh, uh, improved, uh, finalized, protected BOMA by us. And here, just to give you some uh, uh, preliminary results, uh, of the uh, camera traps, um, we can see that at the moment, actually this presentation is not fully updated, they, but I don't have a, a more updated uh, version of it, but uh, we've seen 800 videos that has been assessed, 62% or actually if you count both types of hyena, it's 80% has been hyenas that we've been uh, uh, recorded around uh, a couple of a few jackals, jackals and only one leopard. And here are some of the videos as well, just to show you. So, as you mentioned, there are some dogs protecting, and this is a, the hyena. Uh, 
passing by uh, but not successfully entering the the uh, bonus gap and finally i think this is the letter that, that we see in the the next uh, So just to uh, finalize uh, uh, the presentation, I wanted to finish uh, with uh, uh, a quote from uh, Ambrose, who, as I mentioned, is a, a local coordinator uh, that states that uh, he's very, I'm very happy after some years now, see the attitudes have really changed after some intervention with our, uh, our program. Communities have started taking part in protecting themselves against this predation instead of continuing to complain and blame the government. And I finish by thanking uh, very much all the leaders and participants of these communities and uh, the funders.